Hey, this is David Hayter. You may know me as the screenwriter of films like X-Men, X-Men 2, and Watchmen, but you probably know me best as the voice of Solid Snake from Metal Gear Solid. And you're listening to Hawaii's number one podcast, the Casanova Podcast. Kept you waiting, huh? Right, and welcome everyone to another episode of Hawaii's number one podcast, the Casanova Podcast. I'm your host, Mikhail Casanova, and today I have the honor and privilege of interviewing the one, the only Tom Buck on the show. Tom, how you doing? <laughs> I'm doing really good. Thank you for that intro, and thanks for having me. Of course, of course, man. Uh, how, how's your day been? And how's the new year? How's your New Year's? <laughs> it's all been, I mean, it's all been pretty good. Uh, definitely can't complain super low key and quiet obviously mm -hmm. because of everything that's happening but i like that so i don't really mind um i was totally cool with like oh no you have to stay home and do nothing for the holidays <laughs> fine by me <laughs> <laughs> yeah i definitely um it, it's kind of interesting because a lot of my friends have uh we, we've gone through several lockdowns out here in hawaii so a lot of my friends have been losing their minds like having they're like oh i don't i have to stay home and i, I have to just deal with that and i'm thinking but you complain about your job don't, in that you, you get to stay home and still get paid. Like <laughs> it's a blessing in disguise. The grass is always greener, I guess. But yeah, it's uh, I haven't I mean, it's been a great excuse to like, hey, you have more time to try and work on stuff. And mm -hmm. I'm a pretty big homebody to begin with. So it's a good fit. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Well, um, yeah, let's go ahead and um, and and dive into the show, man. And Go ahead and, um, if you don't mind do, doing an introduction for yourself, the people who don't, for the two people in the back that don't know you. Yeah, how could they not? <laughs> how could they not know me? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, my name is Tom. I have a YouTube channel called Tom Buck, where I really just cover videos and things to help people level up their audio and video quality because I'm a huge video and audio production nerd, basically forever. And the past, you know, six months to a year, I've been really kind of focusing on a lot of like podcast gear and live streaming <laughs> setups and those kinds of things. And then my full time day job is I'm a high school digital media teacher. So I just kind of live and breathe the stuff all the time. <laughs> and uh, the, between those two things, mm -hmm. that is about all the time in the world that I have. So that's about <laughs> that's like literally it. If you want to know what I'm doing, it's one of those two things at all times. Okay, so so you're pretty much the cool teacher that everyone loved in, in, in school. Okay, so <laughs> sure, yeah, we'll we'll go with that. We'll go with that. I was talking to my students this morning, actually, I forget why. I was telling a story from like my third grade class because we were doing mm. an online class, and they were like, "Oh, like Mr. Buck would have been cool to have in class." And I was like, "No, that's not how it was." <laughs> Let me tell you, like, if you go back in time and tell all the people I went to school with, that'd be great because they did not feel that way. <laughs> Yeah, I um, it, it's funny when I think back to like, um, <clears throat> like when I was in uh, high school and college, and it feels like it was so long ago. God, it was almost twenty years ago. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like it, it's something like when you're in your thirties and you think back to like high school and and, and college, and it's like was it that long ago. Yes, it was. It it's was kind of scary, right? <laughs> so like, so so like when I think back to uh, when I had teachers that uh, it did media and video production and stuff like that they were always the coolest teachers in like that that was the class you were always looking for yeah so, like... for sure i mean <laughs> i i don't know i feel bad if they're listening my teachers from 20 years ago um i had one video production teacher who was like pretty cool they were all pretty hands off pretty mm -hmm. into their own thing whatever they were doing and seemed to be battling at least a mild depression so it was like a weird environment to be in <laughs> and then the gear we had was just like vcrs to edit with and it's just kind yeah. of like you're turned loose like here's a broken handy cam and a vcr go make a video and you're like okay um and we did get though in my my 
ninth, tenth grade video production class was when we got the first iMac that could edit. Mm -hmm. It's like it was the iMovie 1.0, and that was so amazing. Like I would stay after school as long as I could and just work on little videos and stuff. And I remember our teacher like spent a huge chunk of our budget one year on a hard drive that mm -hmm. we could never fill up because it had so much space. It would be impossible for us to fill up 10 gigabytes mm -hmm. on the hard drive. <laughs> and uh, we were all very proud of our 10 gigabyte hard drive. Man, kids these days would be like, 10 gigs, that's nothing. Uh, I know. Like, <laughs> it's ridiculous. But like, I, I like having affordable storage, though, so I'm cool with it. Right? You remember when things like, it was huge back in the day when it was like, uh, oh, this, this, this is... How many megs? Like that was huge. Oh, oh yeah. my god. A gig of RAM? Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's crazy when you think about how like technology has changed over like the last just in the last decade alone, but the last two decades, it's been absolutely insane. Yeah, it seems like you and I must be kind of the same age because we sort of lived through that transition, which I think is pretty cool. Like that's a, a unique perspective to have of like, you know growing up like if you wanted to know if your friend was home you just had to like go to their house yep and knock on the door <laughs> and see if someone answered uh or maybe call them on the phone and like let it ring a million times mm -hmm. and like i guess they're not home and then to have like youtube <laughs> yeah is just it's it's a very interesting transition to live through i was actually uh i did a live stream uh, a couple of days ago and i was actually talking to my audience about that about how like things are just so different now because um, my, my wife and I were expecting our first child and well, at That's the time true. of this recording about a month and a half. Wow. And so, so we were, um, we, we were, I was talking to my audience about that. I was like, it's interesting when I think back to like the way I grew up or the way her and I grew up, where it's like you went outside, you played outside, literally you went to go see if your friends are home you, know, you didn't really memorize uh, phone numbers back then. You just, well, for the young folks, for us young folks, we did. We would just go over to our friend's house or, you know, how there wasn't as much of a dependency upon technology for the, the common household back then to now. It's like you see, I, I see kids that are like seven, eight years old with cell phones. And I'm like, I didn't get my first phone until I was like almost 20. 20 something <laughs> i went to college i got my phone <laughs> i was definitely i was in high school and I, my parents gave me my first phone for christmas it was like the nokia like the nokia one that you can't yeah play, you know um <laughs> it was that one and it was just because i was like working and so i would like go to work after school and they just wanted me to have a phone but uh i remember i didn't i was like what am i what do I do with a phone? I would just like leave it in the car all day. Cause yep. I was like, what am I going to carry this in my backpack? I don't want a phone. <laughs> <laughs> Little did I know. You remember when you, uh, what was it? Uh, you had free minutes after nine. Oh yeah. Yeah. Call me back after <laughs> nine. <laughs> or at like the end of the month would be coming and you'd be like, Oh, I only got, you know, 18 minutes left this month. So yeah. Free nights and weekends with rollover. Oh, yeah. All these things. <laughs> So um let's, let's let's dive into like uh dude your 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 backstory. So um what got you into uh be going wanting to decide to be a teacher? Like that I don't I don't really I don't really know what it was, but I it's like I can kind of remember wanting to teach since forever. Uh mm -hmm. I was just so interested. I don't know if maybe it was growing up you watching cartoons and stuff and like all the characters are going to school and everybody in the school. And like before you're in school, it just seems like the coolest thing in the world. Mm -hmm. and then you go and you figure out otherwise. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I remember like, I have a weird memory of being in kindergarten and like begging my mom to take me to the teacher supply store so I could buy my own, well not buy my own, but she could buy me like <laughs> workbooks and stuff, which was like pretty nerdy. And then I saw like my teacher there and I think I cried because I was like the teachers at the teacher store and like the stars are aligned. And there was just something about, I really don't know what it was. It was just something about classroom teaching. I just, I just thought it was really cool. And then as I got older, I got really into media and video and that kind of stuff and really like strong debate over, well, do I go to film school? Do I do something else? And 
uh, a lot of like my childhood was kind of unstable and mm -hmm. stability was a very big priority for me. And so it kind of was like, well, I would, I want a career where I'm going to get a paycheck before I'm 30. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, teaching was just like, I was really good at English. And I was, you know, it was like, I could be an English teacher and went to school for that and always did media stuff on my own. And then the two just sort of like, magically converged into then mm -hmm. now you're the digital media teacher oh, okay it all it all came together in that way which was very very cool so that's uh the the shortest version i can give of that story i was, I was about to say you can give the long version man we love we love story time over here <laughs> it's, i mean it's it's a tricky thing because like i didn't i didn't have a particularly good school experience like my i had I think mostly bad teachers, honestly. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in kind of a crummy town, went to kind of crummy schools, but I had enough good teachers and maybe I was just like critical enough to think like, well, if I were doing it, I would do it this way and that way. Mm -hmm. And then you just kind of think, and I think I had enough of the, of the teachers where like the thing, the last thing in the world you would want to do is disappoint them. Like I didn't mm -hmm. even care about my grade, but if I turned in an assignment and they just kind of wrote like, this is very average or whatever. It wasn't the grade that hurt. It was me disappointing them that hurt. And I thought mm -hmm. that was like, that was so interesting to me that someone could set the bar so high that it, just me trying to reach that mark, which was probably impossible, was going to force me to go further than I would have on my own. Mm -hmm. And and then I just, you know, I was just sort of looking at at some of the other teachers that I, that I had in my life. And I was like, they seem to have decent lifestyles and it seems like a good career you're doing something positive you know you get to go to bed every night thinking that you did something to try to help other people in a positive way and it it just sort of seemed like something that that I was really into and I remember feeling you know a, a big sense of relief when I finally made that decision of this is what I want to do uh, versus like the the film school route which I had like my best friend went to film school which is so interesting because we're like almost the same person <laughs> 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 and like and we we were each sort of making the same decision but we chose the different options so it's like we can look at each other and see like oh that's what that world would have been like and that's what that world would have been like mm -hmm. and there's pros and cons to both um but the the thing that i really learned because i got so into cameras so early on like i mean like four or five years old was getting into like eight millimeter cameras and stuff mm -hmm. and just just so interested in that stuff forever that what I didn't want to do was turn it into a career that sucked the joy out of it. Mm -hmm. And that was a big reason too, why I decided not to go to film school or anything like that. And just like, I'll do this on my own for fun. There's no pressure. It's just me doing whatever I want to do. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, by just sort of following the things that you're interested in, you don't necessarily even have to have a purpose for it. And at some point it can all kind of like connect in these other ways that you can't plan for and it just sort of like happens you know um mm. i when i was 15 i started uh interning at a local tv station mm -hmm. i think they because i was a freshman in high school and i sent a, i typed him a letter and sent it in the mail and asking if i could intern and i think when i said i was a freshman wanting to intern they assumed college <laughs> and <laughs> not high school and they were like yeah yeah sure join the thing and this was like this was uh early 2001 and mm -hmm. they were like i guess there was no follow-up on that i was like he says he's a freshman it's fine and it was supposed <laughs> to be two months and ended up going on for like six years uh wow with paid positions throughout there so not just unpaid intern for six years but <laughs> it was cool because what I learned was like, I, I really, I, I didn't know what I was doing, um, this strategy, but it was kind of something my parents instilled in me, which was like, really, really like, give it your all. And mm -hmm. I was commuting or I was commuting. I was being like, I was hopping a ride with my mom on her way to work, which is like an I'm hour commute commuting. both ways. Yeah, I, wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't driving or anything. I was, didn't even have a license. And then working like, you know, a nine or 10 hour day unpaid and then going back and just doing that four days a week all summer. And then mm -hmm. summer was over. They were like the other interns left and like, would you like to stay on for weekends? Sure. And then a year later, I was like, I think I need to like get a job that pays money. <laughs> and they're like, well, we can't hire you. But if you stay on as an intern, you can intern wherever you want because we don't want to lose you. So like, do you want to be in the production department? Do you want to be in promotions? Do you want to be mm -hmm. wherever? 
and I just got to do like a little bit of everything over the coming mm -hmm. years. I got hired in different positions and I learned so much. And then I learned like, oh, TV news, not for me because it's 24 seven, 365 and mostly negative. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but that's what, I mean, that's where I got like my first bootleg copy of Photoshop. <laughs> <That's where laughs> I, my first bootleg after effects. <laughs> You know, I learned all that kind of stuff there. And then I would go home and, and do, you know, my friends and I had a quote unquote band and mm -hmm. we had like a website and I would try to like make graphics for the website and make the album cover and do all this stuff. And it was just, just following those interests and passions is without needing an end goal. Cause I think some people oftentimes are like, I want to start a YouTube channel, a podcast or whatever mm -hmm. so that I can so that I can quit my job or be rich or whatever. And th there's nothing wrong with having a goal, but I think when you just do it for the purity of pursuing something you're curious about, that's mm -hmm. what's going to open doors that you can't really plan for, you know? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so I just kind of kept doing that. And then teaching showed up and it just happened like my second or third year of teaching, a uh, teacher on campus just randomly left like six weeks into the school year. And I was teaching English and because I kept doing all of this stuff, my, the principal was just like, Hey, uh, he's leaving. I know you're into this and you have a background in, in TV. And I had worked as a graphic artist in, in college for like four or five years. Mm -hmm. um, do you want this position? And like, before I even knew what it was, I was like, yep. And then I took over this completely, <laughs> this <laughs> ridiculously like dated slash hoarder's nest of a digital media program and just had to like kind of reboot it but it was such a cool experience to do that and then about five years later i got the chance to move to a new school and build one up from the ground up from scratch on like a brand new campus and stuff and um and that was about five years ago now so that's that's kind of been it, it's it's all just you know it, it's very very interesting to just sort of see how these things are going and now to be totally honest too i'm sort of i sort of feel like i'm near the tail end of my teaching career because I'm mm -hmm. sort of getting a little burnt out on it and a little kind of jaded <laughs> on public <laughs> education. It's fun, and it's, you know, it, I, I'm very lucky in, in global pandemic time. Having mm -hmm. a paycheck and health insurance is amazing, and mm -hmm. I have wonderful students and stuff, but it's just like I – you sort of live in Groundhog's Day when you're a teacher because it's just the same. Like, yeah. You, you reach the end of a cycle, and you start the cycle over, and even the – best students I have can only reach a certain level because they're 17, 18 when they graduate. Yeah. You, know, you can only get so good at that point in life. And then you go back down to like, what's a camera? Like, how do I log into a computer? <laughs> and you just sort of live that over and over. And I'm just kind of, I'm, I feel like I've done it enough yeah. now, and I'm ready to kind of maybe branch out God willing and try other things. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, it's the longer version. <laughs> Hey, hey, I love love the, the longer version of it. So, so what um, if you were to potentially go into like, uh, you know, you say this is you feel like you're at the tail end of it. What would you ideally like to go into? It's that's a great question because I've definitely learned the grass. The grass is always greener. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I used to work retail and work for other things and, you know, work at the TV station, work as a graphic artist. And you'd always think like that teaching job is going to be sweet. And then you get the teaching job and you're like, oh, this other thing would be sweet. What I yeah. have learned is that I just don't like working on other people's stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I like working on my own thing and building my own thing. And when I started my YouTube channel, it was such a, like a freeing, the, like it was the most liberating thing I've ever done, even though... Mm -hmm. You know, I had done 50 videos <laughs> and had like 20 <laughs> subscribers. Like it was not growing. It was not a revenue generating thing at all. It was just, I, I had watched YouTube for so long and I always thought it was so cool that people could have channels. Mm -hmm. And I, I was like, I wish I could do that as if there's a barrier to entry. Like you just click the button, create account, and then <laughs> it's <funny. laughs> That's it. Um, and and by, by doing that, it was like kind of dipping my toe in this world. I don't know if maybe you felt this like when you started your podcast, you're like, you're listening to people doing these things and then you kind of dip your toe in and you're like, yep. am I sort of a part of this? And then you totally can be. And uh -huh. anytime, then you just kind of jump in. And in doing that, it's been amazing to connect with other people from all over the world to to really feel validated in the stuff that I'm interested in, the stuff that I'm skilled at, like the knowledge that I have. Uh, you know, 
after about a year, the channel started kind of organically generating revenue, which wasn't very much, but I was mm -hmm. kind of like, well, if I keep going and, and actually maybe put like some strategy behind it, it could potentially generate like a decent chunk of revenue. Uh, and so that's kind of like, I've been trying to do that without <laughs> like selling out and, <laughs> and <laughs> I, I have a very, very strict, like, I don't know, maybe it's just cause like, I, I just, <laughs> I grew up listening to like old punk bands and stuff. So it's like the, the, I still have that in me where it's like, you can't sell out, man, and blah, blah, blah. But I kind of like it on YouTube because I feel like so, like how many VPN ads do I need to hear from people yeah. who do nothing to do with VPNs? Like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to just shill products to people. I yeah. like to share stuff I'm excited about. And if yeah. it's a product, that's because I'm really like, I, if you go to my channel, I talk about the Roadcaster Pro podcast recorder all the time. But that's because mm -hmm. I spent years without it and that came out and I was like, oh my God, this solves so many problems. I'm so excited about this thing. And then a community kind of formed around it. Um, mm -hmm. And so trying to, you know, be sure I don't compromise my own values and ethics, but while also trying to grow something, but it's been great because it has been growing mm -hmm. and people have been like, people, it's funny because I feel very fortunate that I haven't had to choke it to life so much. People have been asking like mm -hmm. for, for months, people were sending me emails going like, do you do consultations? Do you do consultations? And I was like, no, 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 I don't. I don't. And my wife was like, why not? You're leaving money on the table. And I was like, <laughs> and people would say, I will pay you. And I was like, maybe I could do that. So I, you know, so kind of set up a thing, set aside several hours a month. Or I was like, if people want to book a consultation, they could. And then they mm -hmm. did. And I was like, this is interesting. <laughs> um, and then, you know, stuff like my wife is big on working on online courses. That's what mm -hmm. she kind of puts them together. And, you know, sometimes, you know, people put together a course and it's like just a money grabbing. Ploy. Yeah. <laughs> and other yeah. times they're yeah. really good and really, really helpful. And, you know, I figure like, well, if I have 10 years as an actual teacher, I might actually be a good person to put together a course on something. Mm -hmm. and so that's something that's a goal for this year is to kind of do that and just create all these different revenue streams so that eventually the income that it brings in is enough that that I can do my thing. And I'm also mm -hmm. not reliant on any one thing, which I know is like the most basic, you know, independent creator financial advice there is, but I don't want to be reliant on just YouTube ad revenue and then some change mm -hmm. happens and it's like unemployment line. So, you know, figuring that out is kind of where I'm at. And just seeing if it grows into something that's viable um, mm -hmm. and kind of only time will tell, honestly. <laughs> but that's yeah. that's the ultimate goal is just do my own thing, which okay. is the most millennial sounding thing I could probably <laughs> say. But... <laughs> uh, I will say like you and I, we have a lot, quite a lot in common, uh, okay. especially our background. So uh, also at a punk rock band um okay. <laughs> we used to call ourselves uh edge of reason i was the lead guitarist and vocalist oh. um i remember that feeling because a lot of punk rock back in the day was uh definitely about you know, don't sell out yes i i remember that <laughs> i definitely remember that um i um i grew up uh so so for me a little stepping in delorean with me mm -hmm. um i grew up technically in um was in Samoa. So I uh, grew up in Samoa until I was seven and then came to the United States when I was uh, seven and a half, going on eight. I had to learn English on top of culture and everything. But we went to um, Memphis, Tennessee. So when I was in Memphis, of all places, coming from an island, wow. going to the south. That culture was a shock. lot. Yeah, super <laughs> large culture shock. And it's like trying to understand the language and then the main thing that got me through all that was like JRPGs, like Final Fantasy and playing music and singing. Yeah. So uh, punk rock was the biggest thing for me, like in learning. Well, it like it, it expressed my feelings, you know, the frustration and stuff like that mm -hmm. that I was going through. And then, you know, I also did art internships with um, the local media studio those there and uh that, that's what i'm saying like it's just like we have so, like i'm i know right so it's like um you know learning uh went through the same thing getting a bootleg copy of photoshop and premiere and all that <laughs> stuff like i feel like everyone who goes through media studios goes through that so it's like that that was interesting going through that and getting to the point of you know 
learning because you know for me the only time i really got to to interact with tech in that way was when i did my internships and so because we didn't have like it was crazy I was an intern who didn't have a computer at home. So I would stay at the internship after class Mm -hmm. and just, or or over the summers and just work on stuff and just, I had to teach myself because I was like, I never know when I'm going to be able to use this again. (laughs) You know? So, um, you know, fast forwarding to where I'm at now, like I understand fully what you, you're saying about, you know, that the self-fulfillment part, because like I did it for 10 years Mm -hmm. And before that, I did retail. I don't, it's funny because my wife and I, we went to like, uh, I think we went to like either Walmart or Target the other day because we were looking at stuff for our, our baby on the way. And we we're like, I was saying to my wife, I'm like, I don't think I can do this anymore. Like, I don't think I could ever go back to doing retail. And it's not, well, and when I say I don't think I can go back, it's not that I can't go back. Like, I wouldn't want to because it's right. like every time you've, hit like an echelon you're like all right well i did this what's next that's that feeling of what's the next thing you want to do yeah i definitely think uh, everybody should work a retail job yes the perspective is amazing (laughs) yes (laughs) it's incredibly like i i did microsoft retail and i did um was it uh best buy Mm. and it was uh it, it it definitely feels like groundhog day because every time you go in there it's like Oh, this is a sales number we got to do. We got to get so many credit card activations. We got to yeah. sell so much of this product. We got to get this. We got to all these add-ons. And then when the day is done, like, yeah, we did it. And you feel accomplished. And you come in the next day and you're like, oh, well, crap. Um, I got to do this all <laughs> over again. <Back> zero. <laughs> right? But um, going into content creating, like, I, I've tried to explain this to my parents because my mm. parents don't get it. And I've tried to explain mm-hmm. it to a lot of my friends. <laughs> like, they don't get it. They're like, you're just hitting record on a camera and yeah. playing from a microphone. And I'm like, you don't understand what it feels like to have fulfillment in something that you've created yes. that people gain value from. Yeah, it's There's no feeling like that. <laughs> Yeah, you definitely become kind of a junkie for it. Like it's it, every time you make the thing, you know, you go through the process of sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's a struggle. But when you're mm-hmm. done and it's finished and it, whatever it is, is like ready to go out there. It's such a, a like a rush, a good feeling. Mm-hmm. And then, then when you put it out there and people start interacting with it, it just there's nothing quite like that. And not from like an egotistical point of view, but just from I mean, it's it's just your really you're not just dipping your toe into that world like we said earlier but you're you're like a part of it and now you're Mm -hmm. you can help shape the conversation and you can i don't know you just can help other people figure stuff out or just have fun and enjoy stuff and it's it's pretty magical it really is especially if you can if you can make an income from it like that also kind of validates it but like one of the things like i i've noticed like with your videos, like you, you've done work with other companies such as Rode and dude, how surreal is that? Well, it's so, so I've never done a Rode sponsored video. <laughs> um, okay. But Rode has sent me, what have they sent me? They sent me like a tiny pack of Rodecaster accessories, mm-hmm. which are literally like headphone adapters and something. And they sent, they did send me a PSA one boom arm. Mm-hmm. And they sent me um, a video mic NTG, but they only sent me those things because uh, my friend Peter Lindgren has, he's from mm-hmm. Sweden and he has a giant YouTube channel and we do a podcast together mm-hmm. and he asked them to send me stuff. So, <laughs> but, but Rode on social media, like they send me messages sometimes and talk and they're, they're so nice and they're just so, so supportive I'm mm-hmm. sure that if I were more aggressive about like, hey, could I uh, have this or do that? But I don't, I you know, I don't, I don't want that since I make so many videos about that content. I don't want it to seem like, oh, now he's just the road sponsored guy. Cause yeah. Like, no, like I, I did pay for all of these microphones and all this stuff mm-hmm. myself. And I think that helps keep it authentic. And I use them. I know I'm using a Shure microphone right now, but. <laughs> but it's okay um but i think that that just helps so i'm not too i'm not trying to like go for the road sponsorship unless mm-hmm. 
what I think would be cool for sponsored stuff is if it enables you to do something you couldn't do otherwise. So like, I would mm -hmm. love to, you know, I don't know, even something as simple as like my wife's YouTube studio. Cause she has a channel too. She has two channels. Mm -hmm. And you know, like, Hey Rhodes, sponsor this video where like we outfit her with like a really good audio. Setup. Mm -hmm. That would be cool. Um, or something like that. But there's other stuff like uh Nam light is a lighting company. I bought like the Pavo tube lights. They're really cool. Mm -hmm. Like RGB tube lights um they reached out to me and they were like oh do you wanna um do you wanna you know try one of our lights we like your videos and stuff and i was like oh sure like i like your guys' products mm -hmm. um and i was i kind of went through their catalog and gave them ideas like well this light could be used for this and these lights could be used for that and this could be used for that and they were like okay we'll just send them all to you and i was like oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> so that's I bring that up because currently I keep getting these shipments from Nanlite. And I'm like, I have so many lights now to do things with. And that is <laughs> mind blowing because like, I mean, oh my <clears throat> God, like I just remember, I mean, I remember literally saving up for like a year or more to buy a piece of gear, you know, like a camera mm -hmm. or, or like a big high end piece of gear, especially as a kid, even like high school, college, you're like, I can't afford buying a shore sm57 which is like a hundred dollar microphone was a anxiety inducing purchase in college mm -hmm. so I was like, i'm spending a hundred dollars on a microphone i don't know like can i do this and so to have a company go like here's thousands of dollars of lights like just have fun with them uh okay it's yeah it's just pretty surreal but it's what i have found is i put together last year this um i call it an ethics statement which some people have on YouTube and stuff. And it's just sort of a guideline for how I handle brand deal deals and partnerships and stuff. And I like posted it on my website and put links to it everywhere. So that way I have it, the brands mm -hmm. can see it and anybody in the world can see it. So we all know how I'm operating and mm -hmm. it's so unfriendly to brands. <laughs> <laughs> it's like almost stupid. <laughs> like it's like they have to crawl through like a field of broken glass to to like for the privilege of working with me. <laughs> but it filters out all the weird little like it filters out all that shady stuff. And so by mm -hmm. the time like if you ever see something on my channel where I say like this was sent to me or this video is sponsored by for what it's worth, it's like a seal of approval like this company not only not only is it something like I use and believe in, but like they're on board with with my values and what I do, and it's you know it definitely like has my endorsement. It's not the thing mm -hmm. they just happen to write a check that week or something. Um, but anyway, that's that's kind of it's a weird world to navigate. But I have found that holding out on holding out as much as possible will open the doors to the the bigger ones, like you know, Rode yeah. or, or Nanlite or, or any yeah. of those kind of companies. That I actually want to work with, <laughs> yeah. Versus weird Amazon reseller. Oh God, <laughs> <laughs> I, I I could talk about the Amazon reseller. <laughs> like I, so there's this one company. I, I'm not going to say their name. You know, one thing I I, I definitely don't want to do is burn bridges. But yes, <laughs> there's this one company that had a Kickstarter podcasting setup thing. I think I know exactly and, what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I want, like, I saw it came with the two mics. It came with the, the interface. Mm -hmm. And uh, it came with the headset. And I was really wanting to cover it. And one of my friends who's a, a YouTube, I think he just hit a 100,000 mm. uh, recently. But he got it last year. And he's promoting the company. And I'm like, oh, cool. Like, they're sending him stuff. Like, And then they finally hit me up. And... I remember they had a tweet that went out where they were looking for content creators to do podcasts and stuff like that. So I was like, okay, cool. Uh, I responded to the tweet and they hit me up and then I was like, all right, cool. So you want me to review this podcasting setup? And then the trail of emails, <laughs> the trail of emails, there's a lot of broken. Look, I can make fun of it because English is not my first language, but the, <laughs> the broken English was kind of like a, Okay, um, a little suspect, but I'll keep mm -hmm. going with it. And then I kept reading further into it, and then they kept sending me more emails. And they sent me one where they're like, "Well, can you pay for this microphone and this set audio interface, and then we'll reimburse you?" And I was like, "Pay for it? 
no, then it, then it's not going to be an authentic review. It's going to be a paid review. I mean, granted, them sending you stuff is technically a right. paid review, but like at least I, I I'm like you. I have a disclaimer about you know how I do reviews because mm-hmm. one thing you want to do, you definitely want to maintain your integrity when yeah. you're doing this. You can't but, replace that when you lose it. Yeah, you you can't, and it's like I. I, you know, when I kept inquiring, like, okay, so you guys want me to to pay, to pay for it? Like, what? <laughs> like, you know, and then it, it just got to a point where I was like, no, I, and I, I I was very vocal to them about how I can't compromise my integrity as a, it, like, I look at, my, you know, with all the products that I review and, and have no website and putting written reviews up, I view myself as an independent journalist. And the one thing about journalism, because I I did a lot of that for the college newspaper. I was, I was part of. Um, it's never compromised integrity for getting out the, the the truth or the the facts of the matter. And I just I couldn't do it. And they kept trying to pressure me to like, you know. And, and it's funny you run into that with a lot of Amazon resellers. Yeah. A lot of them. <laughs> yeah, I've learned that what they what they want you to do, which I I get the strategy. And it's not mm-hmm. that everyone who's an Amazon reseller is shady or anything, but yeah, it's definitely different than dealing with like the company directly. Yeah, um, but it it's they'll want you to buy it and refund you because then you can be a verified purchase, mm-hmm. which means then then your review video or your review can go up on the Amazon page, and it like I I don't know, it's just I get it, but it's also not what I'm interested in. So yeah. It's just, and some of the things that you get asked to review are just completely bizarre. <laughs> it's like sometimes they clearly know what kind of channel you are. It's like, hey, here's a weird microphone or a, or something. But other times, like I got one last week that was, uh, it was like, hello, sir, good to meet you. Would you like to review our eyelash serum? And I was like, <laughs> I have no idea what this is, but I know it's not related <laughs> to what I do. Uh, and <laughs> clearly. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's such a funny world. I've gotten emails from companies that they forgot to take the other person's name off of it. So, and sometimes it'll be it's happened a couple of times. It'll be like a someone I recognize who's a higher level like YouTuber than me. Um and then it'll say like dear so and so, dear Tom, blah, blah blah and I'm like, "Oh, so you sent this email to them too." And then I'm kind of honored. I'm like, "Oh, you would like you would group me in with them." Well, I'm flattered, <laughs> but also no. <laughs> uh there was a company which I, I don't, I'll be making a video about this, but right now um, there's a, a backlight kind of behind me shining like my rim light. It's a Falconize mm-hmm. RGB light, which is this really cool uh, LED like panel light. So it's mm-hmm. flat and it's super cool, flexible. Um, I bought one and then Falconize reached out and th- it was kind of the same thing where there's definitely a language barrier. And they were like, we have a new version of that light that's RGB. Do you want to try it out? Would you make a video on it? And I was like, well, I love my other one, which I just paid for. You can send me this, but I don't make videos for free products because Mm -hmm. a light is cool, but like realistically, you know, whatever, it's a $500 light. I wouldn't make a client video for $500. Like Mm -hmm. I would charge way more. So I'm not going to make a video and then also put it on my channel and then, you know, possibly weird up my reputation or, or anything like that. So no, but if you want to send it to me, I'm happy to check it out. If I like it, mm-hmm. it'll probably end up in a video. I'm sure it'll get mentioned. If I love it, I'm sure I'll make a review on it because I'm a fan of it. Um, and they, they, it was like months of back and forth. And I was like, one, I don't care. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, I am not begging you for, you reach out to me. Like I'm not begging you yeah. for this light. Um, and then finally, like, I was like, okay, you can send the light, but I'm not going to guarantee a video. It's just, if mm-hmm. I like it. And then they were like, well, okay, if you get the light and you don't want to make a video, can you send it back? And I had to go like, we're in the middle of a pandemic. I don't really want to be shipping like a 20 pound package back and forth across the earth to like different continents. Uh, it's just not the thing that I want to be doing right now. Yeah. And then I didn't hear from him for like three months. And then finally they were like, Hey, if you just want the light, we'll send it to you. No strings attached. I was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> and of course I get it and it's fantastic and I love it. And of course I'll make a video about it because it's great. But it's like, wow, you guys, like <laughs> just just you know, like watch a couple of my videos, see how I do things, and then understand mm-hmm. that would have saved us so much time and so much back yeah. and forth. <laughs> but anyway. It, it, 
it, it's funny how like it, and, and for those who, who may be considering getting into YouTube or are more into like the more I guess the category we're in is tech and 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 whatnot. Like if you were to get into that field of YouTube, like yeah, you're gonna have that happen. Mm -hmm. And sooner than you think like they're like yeah. you have one subscriber okay you have a potential customer you can reach <laughs> in a way you're like that's just me on a different account right um, <laughs> but you know in a way I, I like it when brands reach out to smaller channels because i think that is a, a benefit to that kind of marketing is like mm -mm. is it is it is really target it is smaller but it's a real specific community um mm -hmm. and it can be super cool like polar pro is a company they make like filters and stuff I had bought their stuff for years. I think it was before, maybe right around the time my channel hit a thousand subscribers. They reached out and wanted to send me a bunch of like really nice filters that were really expensive. Mm -hmm. No strings. They had no, they didn't tell me anything about making a video or, or whatever. They're just like, hey, we love your channel. Do you want these filters? Like, let us know what size you need. And from that time on, they were just so supportive of like anything I needed. I could just be like, hey, can I try this? Can I? Yeah, sure. Here you go. And it's like, never asked for anything in return. <laughs> uh, and it was just really cool because it was like, I just felt, I don't know, it was it was a great thing to know that they were out there supporting other like smaller channels mm -hmm. and stuff. And I thought that was really cool, which then also highlights the other companies who, who are like, we're selling this weird knockoff wireless microphone thing and here's our list of demands or whatever. And it's like, who, who, <laughs> who are you? Anyway, we, I, don't, I don't want to you know, speak poorly of anybody, but some of the stuff is like, you know, no one's going to buy this thing. You right. Know, like, pocket, <laughs> like a late night salesperson. Like, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting, but it's, it is very funny to navigate that stuff. Cause what I've seen people do mm -hmm. uh, is their channels grow. And as soon as they start getting those, they just start saying yes to everything because they're yeah. excited. It, it really feels neat when someone reaches out and it's kind of like validating, like, oh, you're mm -hmm. at this level where we're, you're on our radar and you just want to say yes to everything. So I've known people who want to say this video is sponsored by because it, it feels like they get to say the thing that they've heard so many times. And I get that. But then they kind of find like, as time goes on, it's tougher to then break out of that kind of realm and into mm -hmm. the, the maybe the higher end stuff or maybe the more legitimate stuff. And so it's definitely good to like save yourself for the right, yeah. for the right partnerships, if any, and, and maybe you're, you don't want to do any at all. Yeah, definitely. I, it's one of the things like um, when I started YouTube and God, I look back on, <laughs> I, I look back at my earlier stuff and I'm like, what were you doing? <laughs> why we all do <laughs> <laughs> so like I, I look back on some of my earlier content and i look back on how i remember years ago uh was it four or five years ago like unboxings were huge that was oh, the gosh, big thing. Yeah. doing the unboxing i was doing the unboxings and then people were like okay that's cool what's the review when, when's the review coming and you know i i look at how my content has shifted from doing unboxings to impressions to where I said now, like with my YouTube channel, I review tech, uh, primarily computers, uh, video game equipment, audio equipment, mm -hmm. uh, as well as I have my podcast and video format over there, too. So I keep it centralized. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten to the point within, I want to say, since I went to E3 2019, um, gotten to a point where companies like bigger gaming companies and tech companies are willing to work with me like yeah um and that urge to always want to say yes is there and i have to like no because i don't want a company or even a viewer to come to my channel and be like oh he has no direction he's just reviewing anything to send to him so like i'm at a point now where there are certain things like uh case in point um if I can grab all of these, <laughs> Let's see. Uh, so I've got a number of oh, wow, including the ones I'm wearing, and about four others sitting. Oh, there's even these right here. I wow, can... that's quite the collection. <laughs> yeah, there. Of, of headphones that I probably like. I've done all my reviews for them, and I'm I my plan is to 
give them to my community because I'm like, I only need one or two right pairs of headphones. Like, I, it, even with um, Rockets or Turtle Beach, they've decided to like invest into me, like, in the sense of, um, I think they sent me like a thousand dollars worth of like keyboards and, and wow. headsets and mice. And I'm over here like, this is crazy because I, I, I was always a. Yeah, like I'm like I I love all this stuff, but I I don't have a need for everything that they're sending me, you know. And once I worked with them, then other doors open. Like even Samsung, like oh. the only thing I've ever done with Samsung is review one product, and which was their Note 10. Mm-hmm. And then they sent me this ultra wide monitor, and I'm like, holy crap! So it's like, but but I keep it tailored to I only cover things that I'm genuinely interested in and some people have given me criticism like oh well you know you're positive about everything you review i'm like no i curate my content to be only things i'm generally interested in because i can't fake enthusiasm about something i don't care about right so yeah i i have the same thing too where people are like it's another positive review and i'm like yeah the fact that the review is on my channel means it's gonna be good because I'm not yeah. gonna make I'm not gonna make a video <laughs> where I'm just tearing a product apart unless like I had a a reason to which I can't I can't, honestly can't imagine that scenario. Mm-hmm. But if a product is really terrible, I I don't know why I would end up with it first of all. But like if someone sent me something and it I was planning to do it and it just didn't work out, I would I would take that up with them and I would talk mm-hmm. to them about like my thoughts or maybe just why it doesn't work for me and I would leave it out of a video. I, I wouldn't you know I'll put cons in in videos of like, Hey, this thing Mm -hmm. does this, but this part's weird or whatever. Like I'll be honest, but I probably will only make a video about something I actually like, which means it's going to be a positive review, but it doesn't mean I love everything. It just means this is the stuff that I like and why I like it and why it works. But yeah, sometimes (laughs) people are like, where's the negative stuff? And of course, negative always goes, goes well. I was planning to do a video. I had a collection of stuff that I had just bought randomly. That was like, kind of like the junk stuff I had accidentally I bought this thing and it really did suck or Mm -hmm. whatever and I was like maybe I'm gonna do like the five worst things I've ever bought video and I knew that would actually probably do well because those kinds of things do and then I just decided you know what like it's just kind of punching down it's not it might be funny but I don't know I mean some people are just trying to do their jobs make their product yeah I don't know and it's just it's easier to then go like here let me tell you about this thing that's amazing and let's enjoy that instead of putting something super negative out there. And I think that's probably better. But, you know, it's YouTube. Like, it's your channel. You can do. Yeah. You can choose what you want to put on it. That's the beauty <laughs> yeah. of it. Yeah. Like, I, I've noticed definitely, like, with negativity in, in YouTube, like, it it definitely booms. Mm-hmm. But, you know, and I've had people say to me, like, oh, man, you should be more negative about this. You should just bash this company or, like, the whole Cyberpunk 2077 <sighs> fiasco. People were like, like, oh, you should tear it apart. And I'm like, but I actually like some aspects of the game. But my, my whole thing with, um, and, and I've given this advice to other people that are starting content creating channels or websites or trying to work with companies. Um, you can be negative in a constructive manner. Yeah, you you absolutely. T- yeah. Yeah. You know, you talk about, okay, it didn't, it didn't meet my expectations for X, Y, Z reasons, but here is, you know, you balance it out with some positives. Like, yeah. there's um, some microphones that were sent to me by Thron Max, and I saw a lot of reviews where people were just praising it. Like, it's the best USB microphone you can buy. It was, oh, it's so much better than than the uh, the Blue Yeti. It's so much better than this, this, and this. And I'm, I used it, <laughs> and I'm like, um, okay. <laughs> this is not a great mic. And like I did a cross comparison to all the other mics I had, including my XLR. And I'm like, this is not really a good mic. And these are the reasons why it's not. And I had a lot of people, including other content creators that covered it, so angry at me. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to put out a dishonest video. Like, it's not great. I like the form factor. I like the setup. What they're going of, for. Of how- yeah like what they're like the visual aesthetic of what they're going for i love it but the performance the microphone quality like you're i'm like and i said in the video i'm like you're gonna ask me to spend a hundred dollars for a mic that sounds like the 
you know, like a boom <laughs> from, from a gaming headset. PS4, no, right? right? <laughs> like no, like they, I'm not doing that. It's it's not that good. It, but I was constructive with it, and the company appreciated. It. Like we, we're grateful you didn't like tear it apart. Like you know some other creators. I'm like I'm not gonna do that. Like I, I would like to work with you guys again. But here's some things that if you went back to the drawing board and fixed this, then this is what I would like to see. Yeah. And, and you know I'll come back to it. Yeah, and sometimes companies will actually respond to that kind of stuff, yeah. you know, if they're able to, and that's that's cool. And I, I, I try to, you know, it's easy to forget all the numbers and all the emails and all the comments and this and that are actual people on the other end. And mm -hmm. you know, you never know. It could the company that's making a thing. It could be like I reviewed. I think it's the most popular video on my channel right now. It's about um, the it, I bought like the cheapest USB microphone I could find on Amazon. Mm -hmm. or it was the cheapest, just the cheapest podcast mic i could find on amazon it was like 20 bucks at the time um and it's it sucks <laughs> 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 and that's that's the way that's the way that it is but it's also i've discovered you know it's the same mic that's rebranded under 10 different names uh mm -hmm. it's the exact same mic and there's not a lot of like r d going into that from the companies and in those cases, no one's going to listen. But in a lot of cases, if it is a small company that's trying to like put their thing out there, like they'll listen and they'll go back to the drawing board and they'll revise yeah. it. And they'll, and then they will want your feedback. And that will also like, because you were honestly critical of them, if they can come back to you with a version two and then you like it, it almost means more than if you just mm -hmm. raise everything all the time. And I think that's better too for the, for the viewer. Cause one thing that drives me personally crazy is when I see glor like reviews that glorify a product, this is amazing. This is the best camera in the world, the best microphone in the world. And you're like, okay, cool. And then you never see it again on that person's channel. <laughs> <You're> like, what <laughs> happened to the, I thought it was so good. <laughs> and it's like, you're not using it. And I like it when, when you know that something is, is being, I, I just like the authenticity and the genuine mm -hmm. part of that. And so I think that that kind of stuff just helps build it up. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Uh, I, I definitely have a couple more questions. Uh, being respectful, respectful of your time, but uh, I mean, we, uh, I'm having a blast. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I, I actually, <laughs> the, the thing I need to go do is, uh, I somehow a couple years ago <laughs> wound up being on the public arts commission for our city. <laughs> oh wow! Um, and so it's a small city. <laughs> it's, oh, not, it's not an elected <laughs> position or anything, but we have an arts commission meeting. Uh, tonight, and then I actually need to go pick up my nan lights from the PO box before <laughs> before it closes. Uh, so that's what I need to go do after after this. But I got a few more minutes. Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool. So um, one of the things I definitely want to dive into. Um, so with podcasting, so what was like that the genesis point that got you into wanting to do a podcast? You have a phenomenal podcast. So oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate that a lot. It's not unlike YouTube where, I mean, I've been mm -hmm. listening to podcasts specifically like subscribing to podcasts since 2009. Mm -hmm. Um, but I started mine in 2019, the beginning of 2019, I started my personal podcast and it was for a really specific purpose, uh, which was as a teacher, I mm -hmm. can't go more than one or two sentences without having to do the like. I have great classroom management and I have great students, but they're teenagers. So it's talking, you know, like, okay, today we're doing sh like the shushing and the, I just have to sit and wait. And then I like, and it makes you feel like a crazy person because you're just battling to get these thoughts out. All day yeah. <clears throat> and then YouTube, I can communicate a little more clearly and effectively, but just the medium of YouTube, which I love, is definitely mm -hmm. catered towards, you know, uh, kind of more condensed, like I, so at least my videos. I really try to trim out all the fat and just leave like the stuff that I think is important, dive straight into the topic, hit mm -hmm. the main points, try to make it entertaining along the way and then end it. The video is as long as it needs to be. And that's it, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which is great, but it doesn't give you a huge chance to, I, I like to contextualize things and I like to kind of yeah. go off over here. And so I was like, you know, I could start a podcast where I can just go <laughs> for as long <laughs> as I want without interruption and it was like um the first like i call it a season because it was just sort of the first 21 episodes i did were mm -hmm. uh 
um, were just kind of that. And it was like so therapeutic. I could explore concepts. I could work on something on my channel and sort of break it down in a podcast episode. And it was really, really great. And sometimes I'd have like my wife come on as, you know, mm -hmm. bounce ideas off each other. And that was really great. And then after about 21 episodes, I was kind of like, I think I got that out of my system now. Like now I, I want to do something else. So I was like, that'll be the end of season one. It's been 21 episodes. It feels like a season. And then I kind of mm -hmm. jumped in and was like, okay, now <clears throat> I did like another batch of 21 episodes around like the theme of sort of starting a business and which was kind of like getting my YouTube channel and, and all that stuff like up and running in a legitimate way of being a business and just kind of mm -hmm. following that journey and then I did the third uh, third season, which was more just about like the creative process. And I started doing interviews and stuff. And uh, now I'm jumping into the fourth season, which is just sort of like, it'll be like a mishmash of interviews and kind of what it started as me just sort of <laughs> going on <laughs> about a topic. But it's really cool. And it's, it's such a different medium. Um, that I, I love it a lot. And then along the way, my wife and I started a podcast too. So we have one that we do every week. We do it as a live mm -hmm. stream. So there's the video component too. And that that's what, that one's cool because it's, we call it the couple's table. And it's just us like, it's just sort of like talking about life related things or issues. And there's a great community that pops up in the chat. So that kind of directs some of the conversation, but it's kind of nice because it has nothing to do with anything I talk about <laughs> on my YouTube channel at all, usually. And so it's cool to just like step out of that world. And then mm -hmm. Peter Lindgren and I have a podcast, which is much more like the back end side of like YouTube content creation. And I, so somehow I went from none to three. <laughs> 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 um, but it's just, it's really fun. And, you know, the past year, one of the benefits, I think, of, <laughs> I was going to say one of the benefits of COVID, but one of the benefits of the pandemic is people have become so much more comfortable with technology like StreamYard we yeah. right now where yeah. you know it was really tougher to get people how do you do an interview how do you do this how do I set up my camera and now it's just like everyone just kind of knows like mm -hmm. how it works and you can just jump in and it, that's been really cool because it's opened up so many doors for podcasting but you know podcasting is is it's just been a really really fun thing that I have zero expectations from and unless I accidentally see them, I pay no attention to the numbers or anything, which is like the opposite of YouTube. Uh, it's, just, it's just a complete, complete passion project on all fronts, but I, I really love it. It's great. And I think it, yeah. I think it adds authenticity because I'm making so many videos about podcasting gear that it's like here you can actually see like, look, there's three podcasts where I'm doing the things I'm talking about. It's not just like, mm -hmm. Look at here's podcast podcast and it's like but you've never done one <laughs> you know like that would be <laughs> that probably wouldn't be super authoritative. Yeah, uh, well, definitely. Um, well, in a way, there there were there <laughs> limited <laughs> limited quantities of, of benefits of, of COVID from last year mm -hmm. uh, was the fact that it did get more people, like you said, you know, accepting of technology. Other thing is, it had a lot of people diving into content creation because oh my it's gosh, like, yes, you know, it was insane. Like Last every time year, I everything around, was sold out. Like back right? order anything to do with podcasting, streaming, you just couldn't get it. <laughs> no, or you know, the, and plus the resellers, like the the people that oh yeah, like, just flip it. Like I I remember seeing like the GoXLR and then the the uh, the Road Procaster. Like they were just like super expensive like a thousand bucks is well out here and i'm like yeah. good god yeah the cam link was a big one because i had a video about the <laughs> cam link which is a hundred bucks and you know you plug your camera into your computer and it looks amazing and then people were sending me comments it. were like it's not a hundred bucks like six hundred dollars and i'm like yeah pay $600 <laughs> for this, please. <laughs> it's a hundred dollars maybe 120 but like, <laughs> yeah but but yeah and then people dove in and started making their own stuff which was i mean really exciting and that that would that really honestly too in terms of youtube like helped me kind of find my footing it helped me really understand a lot of the people who are watching my my channel and what they need mm -hmm. and it it really did help me focus on what i was making and who i was making it for yeah did, you know and, and speaking about the 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 process that the creating process is, um, you know, my, myself and my friend, Roberto Blake uh, likes mm -hmm. to say a lot, the 
process of creating when it comes to like doing the thumbnails doing the editing like i know you recently did a video well when i say recently it's nine months ago but it's still recent you know yeah. it's still recent but you didn't want about getting to a creative rut because it's a very real thing and i think a lot of people don't realize how easy it is you know when you're constantly creating out content especially if you're doing this along with something else but even more so if this is literally all you do it's very easy to get into a creative rut. I've recently, as of last year, I've, I found myself in a creative rut frequently. And your video was very, very helpful. Oh, for I'm me. glad to hear it. <laughs> but um, what led you to make that? Did you yourself get into like a creative rut or? Yeah, it was just, it's kind of like that thing. I don't know, like if you've ever gone to the gym on a good streak and you, you know, you go to the gym for yeah. the first time in a while and your first workouts, you're just, you can't even move afterwards. <laughs> you're so sore. And you keep going and keep going and suddenly you're doing that same workout, but you're not sore anymore. Yeah. And it's like, it doesn't mean that you're done. It means now you need to do something else. And mm -hmm. it's kind of the same thing with creativity where you're like, you, you, especially if you're just starting your channel or just hitting a new stride on something, every video you're like leveling up in a big way. You're figuring something mm -hmm. new out. And then you kind of hit your stride, which is good. It's good to have a workflow. It's good to have a process. But then you just sort of feel like, you know, it, it's tough. Like, I, I remember the thing that hit me was I, I kind of was clicking through some of my recent videos at the time. And I noticed that every video just sort of started with me, like, sitting at this desk. It just faded in. And I was, it, it was, you know, the videos were all very different. They're, they're good. Mm -hmm. But it was like, that's sort of, I guess you could call that a brand. You could call that a style. But it's also, it doesn't seem it's not interesting enough to me. What could I do? And then, and then I just started paying attention to stuff around me. Like I was paying, I was talking about in the video and my wife and I started, we got, we got really heavy into anime and in like 2018, <laughs> 2019, like out yeah. of nowhere. And there's so much really cool stuff in anime shows. Cause they, you know, stylization and stuff like yeah. that. And I, I was working on a MacBook pro review at the time and I, I just stole like the entire intro from an anime, <laughs> which is not, <laughs> It makes sense to look at someone else's MacBook Pro video and go like, oh, I would take that. But you wouldn't think like that's where you're going to get an idea. I did a legend yeah. view where um, the stylization and the editing of it came from like this Hulu commercial I saw for like Hulu <laughs> streaming service. And I just love the way that it was edited. And they kind of like... <laughs> did it to this classical music and i was i had been in my rut of like every time i'm downloading music i'll go to like art list or epidemic click on this category find like everything is already grayed out because i've like downloaded it <laughs> and i was like oh this is opening up a whole new you know working with a different style of music working with a different style of of intro it just mm -hmm. kind of going be getting inspiration from beyond my world and then bringing it into my world was really creatively fun like uh Another one, which I don't think I talked about in the video, was uh, I love Better Call Saul. Mm -hmm. It's one of my favorite shows. Great show. And Great pretty show. Pretty much <laughs> every episode starts with a really slow fade in. And oftentimes it is a fade into something that you're not even sure. You're kind of like, you might know what it is, you might not, but it's visually like, hmm, what is this about? Mm -hmm. And I really love that. And so I started trying to always open my videos with some kind of very intriguing visual and mm -hmm. every video starts with like kind of a slower fade in, which I just like because, you know, when you when you finish your video, YouTube sometimes just auto starts it on the first frame, which can be you in like a weird pose <laughs> or something. <laughs> and so if you fade it out, it's at least just black and then it will fade in. But but it looks cool. It's kind of a nice way to sort of ease in. And so it's like you're not going to look at my, I don't know, my Rodecaster or Rode Pod mic video and be like, that intro fade in is like better call Saul, but like that's where I got the idea <laughs> from. And it's really fun to take all those little cherry pick, all those little bits and pieces. And that can really be exciting. Um, you know, once you get an idea and you're like, I, I really want to, I really want to try something new. Like the other day, my wife like woke up early. <laughs> um, Cause she, her thing is like, even though she's totally capable and could, she's like adamant about not learning Photoshop. <laughs> it, just, it would make her life so much easier, but she just doesn't want to learn it. And so she does Canva, which is like, well, she has a paid version, but there's a free version like on the oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. editing yeah. software. It's actually pretty cool and pretty powerful. And it works because like her audience are people that don't want to learn Photoshop. So it actually is great that she's very well versed in it. Mm -hmm. But she's lately been pushing Canva like to its limits. 
and kind of doing stuff I didn't even know you, you would be possible in it because she's kind of like breaking the rules a little bit. Mm -hmm. And like one day she woke up and she was like, I like it was early in the morning. She's like, I can't sleep. I have this idea. I think I can do like a green screen thing with a Canva animation. I could do this. And, you know, then she just wanted to jump in her office and start like working on a video, that kind of stuff. Like those are the things where you're going to burst out of your creative, your creative rut that you're in is when you find something that you're just so excited to try and jump into. Uh, that's the best feeling. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Sorry about the I dogs bark. I, I don't hear anything. Oh, good. Well, this yeah. Shure MV7 has excellent noise rejection. <laughs> I was going to, um, one of the other things, like I definitely want to ask you, because um, we also have this in common where our spouses are both, um, they, they do, they have their YouTube channels. They both, uh, they, you know, they done podcasts with their significant others. So what is that experience like for you? Like for me, it's surreal having a partner. It is. It's, I highly recommend it. <laughs> um, I mean, my wife and I actually met on YouTube, so that's a very really yeah. It's a very interesting situation. So I've like she was already doing it when we met. Mm -hmm. um, so I've never known her as not a content creator, and I love it because she understands the absurdity of it. She understands the weird feelings you can have, the weird insecurities. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when I need to go lock myself in a room and just talk about something for an hour and 20 minutes, like she gets it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's really cool. I, I, it's, it's great just to have that insight. You know, I can finish a video and show it to her before, before I upload it. She can tell me if it's good or if something feels a little off. Um, it's, it's really wonderful. And I, I feel like I almost take it for granted because I hear stories sometimes of other people where they're like, yeah, I can only do my videos on, you know, between... 10 p.m. and 1 a.m. because that's when everyone's asleep and I can go down into the garage and like do a thing and my wife will get mad if I record on Saturdays, something like that. And it's like, wow, this is the support of a partner is amazing and really, yeah. really helps keep you sane throughout it. So I, I love it. <laughs> yeah. I, I know a lot of um, a lot of my friends that do content creating, they don't have spots like spouses or partners that do creating as well. So, you know, I've heard that I call them the nightmare stories because I don't I don't know how I would deal with it. Where it's like, you know, I know some of my friends are full time creators, and it's like they feel like they're always battling with their significant other mm -hmm. to have that time to create. And it's like yeah. when you have someone that is doing this, and I'm very fortunate that my wife is doing it. It, it again, that's another one of the ups and downs of last year. Uh, her job actually she was with her job for i think 10 12 years and they ended oh, wow. up letting her her and her entire team go and they also closed every store in hawaii <laughs> so yeah. they just pulled out oh. so she was like uh what am i gonna do and i'm like well you like anime you like manga you like video games you like tech just start a youtube channel so she did that she started a podcast and she's she's like okay i understand this now i understand <laughs> you know and she she enjoys it so great you know but my heart goes out to people that don't have that. <laughs> yeah, it's, and it's tricky because, you know, podcasts and YouTube are fun. And, yeah. and like you said earlier, it's like people think, hey, just push and record and being goofy in front of the camera. And, you know, when it's done well, it looks so easy and it looks so effortless. Mm -hmm. and it, it seems so fun. And I, I think people just truly don't understand the the backside of that of, the effort that goes into it and some of the stress that can come with it. And not that that's a bad thing, but it mm -hmm. part of it can be very work-like and very job-like. And I think if you don't have a partner that understands that it's almost like, Oh, you're just going to go like make videos or play games or whatever all day. And you're like, well, that's, that's a part of it, but there's, mm -hmm. there's more. And, you know, I've been in situations previously where I did not have that kind of support and mm -hmm. or encouragement. And you just sort of, it is sad because you have these things you're like, I wish I could do this, but I guess I can't. And so I'll just sort of take that dream and just put it on the shelf and just accept that like, yeah, it's probably not something I can do, which mm -hmm. is really sad because uh, there's no reason not to. And, you know, your time is super limited. And if there's something you're excited about doing, you know, it, it's important to go for it. And yeah, yeah and it's uh, that's that's, you know, part of why starting a YouTube channel for me was just such a liberating experience mm -hmm. okay well winding down to the last two questions i have for you mm -hmm. um 
one of the other things that I, I definitely want to get your insight on is do you feel that the direction, I guess, this digital age that we live in, do you feel that content creating is a, and this is a twofold question. Okay. Is it a, <laughs> is it a viable and sustainable option for people these days? I, uh, <laughs> I'm hoping to find <laughs> out for myself. <laughs> so we will see how I feel about this answer in the future. But I do think, I really do think yes. Um, just based on my own experience, especially as somebody who like has been like, tr tr like avoiding opportunities to make money mm -hmm. um, because that, you know, I wanted to do it my way. I think it is an, an absolutely viable option for, for the right idea for something that is in terms of sustainable. It's like, um, the thing that I always say is like, make a channel, make content, make whatever about the thing that you never shut up about. Like the thing that you're mm -hmm. always talking to your friends about, the thing that your spouse is tired of hearing about. That's the thing you should talk about. Don't early on my channel was doing well because I was making 3D printing videos every once in a while and they were taking mm -hmm. off. But I was like, after eight videos, I was like, I know nothing else about 3D printing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I could have like really tried and the channel probably would have grown much faster, but it, it wouldn't have been in a way that was at all sustainable for me. So it was like, I need to do the thing that I'm, I'm excited about because it's not about mm -hmm. making five or 10 videos. It's, you know, 50, 100, 200, 300 video, like just ongoing. What can you do? And if you have that thing and it fits in the realm of content creation, which pretty much everything has, you know, something that can be created about it mm -hmm. with it, uh, then I think it is very viable. But my wife and I were just talking about this yesterday uh, especially in 2021, people think that YouTube is so crowded because there's so many channels and hundreds and hundreds of hours uploaded every minute and all that kind of stuff, which is all very true. And so you kind of feel like, oh my gosh, if I started something now, like how could I ever get any traction? But the amount of like all those people cut down to the ones who are actually going to do it well, you know, like mm -hmm. I've known people who uploaded every day for a thousand days and ended up with 13 subscribers because like literally no one was watching anything because it was so, so bad. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a, a smaller number of people than the people who do it well, but, but will continue to do it. You know, when things get tough, when they don't feel good, when they, when life gets busy and life happens and, and the ups and downs and things, and you just kind of still like you prioritize it in your life and build it mm -hmm. into something that's a smaller number of people. And then those people, what I've really been learning about in the past year, year and a half is like the business side of it. Um, you know, going into like starting an LLC so you can actually take money and earn revenue and report tax, like doing all that stuff legitimately. I mean, that's going to weed out so many people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so ultimately, uh, even though there's a lot of people, the number of people who are willing to do all of that is actually pretty small and i think if yeah. you're willing to put in that effort and you're able to and you just you know you pay your dues and put in your time i think it can be a really viable option yeah i i, I, hope in, I can in be wrong it, so <laughs> we'll see where i'm at no no I, I i fully agree with you because like you know i i went into i left my career in it to do this and then i've been doing this for full time for a year and wow. Uh, it, it, it is um, it, it's it's very challenging. And one of the things like when I've been talking to people about that, they're like, oh, I want to be a full time content creator. I'm like, do you really do you really do you really want to be like it? Because it's it's more work than a lot of people think. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. They, they, they think like, oh, this is going to be easy. I'm just going to upload videos. I'm going to stream. I'm going to do this. And they don't understand, like, like you said, like the LLC, like I had to go and do that for myself. And yeah. I'm shocked at the amount of creators that are doing this full time that have not done that. And it does <laughs> open doors. <laughs> it opens. Oh, yeah. Yeah. My <laughs> only officially sponsored video at this time is with Epidemic Sound. That was from like over a year ago. Mm -hmm. When they reached out, they were like, OK, you know, to send the to send the payment. Um, what's your EIN? And I was like, mm -hmm. I don't, I just, it's just me just send it to my bank account. It's fine. And like, we don't just pay people. We send it to businesses. And I was like, are you telling, like, I was like, I've seen so many people with epidemic sponsored content. You're telling me all those creators, even the ones with, you know, a couple thousand subscribers have LLCs. And they were like, yes, the ones we work with do. And I was like, oh my God. And 
<laughs> then, then they actually guided me through the process in a very kind and patient way of, of <laughs> which was great. And, you know, like I should almost pay them for that sponsorship because I learned a lot about the business side of it. But that was where I learned a lot of the people I was watching that had channels, you know, my size or even smaller were um, they had already put in the groundwork to do that stuff. And I hadn't even thought about it. And, mm -hmm. and then figuring it all out was <laughs> a whole different mess. But <laughs> yeah, that kind of stuff is... Uh, that's tricky. And you're spending, you know, your whole day is taken up with an appointment at the bank. Like, yeah, you know, that kind of, those kinds of things happen and figuring out taxes and, you know, cause you want to be legitimate and sustainable and figuring out, you know, health insurance and all that kind of stuff. That's, uh, it's, it's a lot. It's definitely a lot yeah. of stress. It's more than just like, I'm going to sit and play a game on camera for an hour. <laughs> right. <laughs> So, 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 um, last question I have for you, is there anything, um, like for this year, uh, for 20 at the time of this recording, we are, what is this January 12th, mm -hmm. 2021, at the time of the recording, are there any goals, ambitions or anything that you're working towards this year? You know? Yeah. Well, 2020 taught me that planning <laughs> is something that <laughs> kind of just hope for the best, you know, but yeah. So I say this now knowing that who knows what's going to happen, but um, that is kind of really the business side of it, like growing the channel. My two big YouTube regrets are that I didn't start sooner. I really yeah. wish, you know, I could yeah. have been doing it for years by the time I got started and that I was scared to be strategic with it early. The first year, year and a half, I was so adamant about like, no, I'm not going to pay attention to numbers. I'm not going to look at analytics. I'm not going to care about money or revenue. And it's like, I, I had to learn that you can focus on those things and still keep your integrity, still keep your values. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with like earning revenue off something that you're putting your time and energy into. I wish I would have learned that lesson sooner. And so this year is more about like, I feel like I have a pretty good proof of concept. And now it's just kind of, um, getting all that stuff really up and running and then mm -hmm. seeing if it's something that could potentially be where like I could make the leap, um, the leap to it. Cause as a, as a teacher, you sign your contract for the next year, usually in the springtime, early summer. And mm -hmm. I'm real interested to see like, am I going to sign a contract? <laughs> Cause there's also just the idea of like COVID has just, has been, has done a number on education and I'm, just yeah, like, this could be the the nice push I need to just say thank you. I will take this experience and now move on to yeah. something to something else. So I'm I'm curious to see if like I'm just curious to see where it will go. But but the goal is to really like build the channel up into into a serious like like a real a legit thing. <laughs> Well, I mean, sir, you, you're already over 50. As of this <laughs> recording, you're over 50,000 subscribers. You've got millions of views. I, I think it's, it's, it's doing really right. well. It's, it's very <laughs> humbling to see those things. And it's it's just sort of going back to talking about stability. Last year, I mean, okay, so we're talking about Viable. Last year, my YouTube channel made $50,000 all in, um, mm -hmm. which is amazing. Amazing. Mm -hmm. I didn't make that much in my teaching job to like my third year. <laughs> so, <laughs> so last year, my YouTube channel made more than I made my first several years in my career with multiple degrees and certifications and stuff. So that's a really big deal to me. Um, that's not enough for me to comfortably leave like a union job with health insurance. Plus, it's been 10 years. So my, sal my job salary has gone up since then. Mm -hmm. um, but that is kind of a proof of concept thing, but now I, I need that to go bigger because also understanding that when you're working for yourself, you know, the, the need for that safety net of uh -huh. savings to be there, the need, the expenses go up, you know, things like we talk about taxes and health insurance, those costs are higher. Uh -huh. um, so it's not about making the same amount you're making your day job. You actually need to make like significantly more. Um, unfortunately, like our cost of living is pretty low. So, there's that thing, but it's also funny because you talked about parents like not understanding and stuff. And my <laughs> my uh, mom is very much of a, a, like, and I understand this, and she's you know an amazing supportive parent. But she's very much the like, you work a job, you work it for like thirty years, doesn't matter if you like it, you're probably gonna hate it, and then you retire uh -huh. and do what you want. Uh -huh. 
And I'm like, <laughs> I get that. But also like, I like my dad passed away last year at 65 oh, and my uh, go, go but yeah. he had, re he had retired long ago for like disability and stuff, but a lot of people retire at 65. And so if I'm waiting that long, it's like he, there'd be literally zero time. Yeah. Uh, whereas now I'm 35 and you know, healthy and I can do stuff. And that's kind of the time I want to like, enjoy the time that I have. And mm -hmm. even I, I, I just avoid this topic with <laughs> parents because even like telling them like, yeah, I made as much on YouTube as I did in my third year teaching. I think it would still be, it's almost like it doesn't, Yeah. it's like not real money. It's like monopoly money or something. And I'm like, no, it's real. Mm -hmm. It's like a real thing. Like you can, you can do it for real, I promise. But, you know, yeah. it's just, I think there's that generational divide. But anything I can do to uh, to bridge that gap would be amazing. So that's kind of my 2021 goal is seeing if that's legitimately sustainable um, for the long term. And, and that's one of the things, too, like with, uh, I, and not only do I have that struggle with my own parents, I have that, I seriously have that struggle with my in laws. They're like, <laughs> oh, yeah, I can imagine. Like, you you left IT blah 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 because like I was a senior systems analyst, so it's like, mm, and then yeah. senior engineer, so it's like they're like you left that to do this, and I'm like, well, <laughs> I'm like, well, we'll put this, and I tried to explain this to them. I'm like, put this in perspective: working 15 hour days, eight days, well, no, seven days a week, no, six <laughs> days a week, 18, like uh, 15, eight days. yeah, it does, it does. So so <laughs> six days a week, 15 hour shifts, then on the eighth day you get a nine hour shift. And then when you're on vacation, you're not on vacation because you're still on call. That was the primary, the backup, and the on call. So it's like I I needed something else. And like I'm I'm very fortunate. Like this doesn't pay yet, yet, mm -hmm. yet, fingers crossed, as much as what I made doing IT, but it does not to cover the basis of the bills. But one of the things like and I I talk about this a lot on my streams and and um frequently on my podcast where you know that very topic of you work a job for 30 40 years like this the stuff that our parents our grandparents and, and, mm -hmm. and prior would say like you do that you're you're not gonna like it but you're gonna do it and then yeah. you're gonna retire you're gonna be you know in your 60s or so and then you've got the rest of your life to do that and i'm the same as you where i'm like i'm in my 30s <laughs> this is kind of my prime yeah I want to do, I want to make use of the, the health and vitality that I have now and not wait 30 years from now and try to feel like I can't. And not saying because there are people that are in their 60s, 70s that are able to oh, for sure. get around and do stuff. But it's like, I feel like now is that time and I don't want to have that regret of what if. Like, yeah. for me, um, and I'll share this with you, like one of the things like I, I'm, I'm two months as of this recording away from being five years in remission from cold oh, wow. cancer. I was uh, stage. Yeah. Th thank you. Like I, I was stage two, almost went stage three. And there was a point where I didn't know how much time I had left. And it's just, wow. It pushed me to be like now or never. And if yeah. this is, you've got like the doctors gave me a year. I'm like, all right, I'm going to do everything I can in the year. The year came. Boom. You, you beat it in remission. All right, cool. Let's just keep that energy going because, yeah. wow. you know, it, I, you you don't want to to have that regret of what if because that that eats a lot of people up, man. <laughs> yeah, that's the. I mean, it's the most cliche thing in the world of like you never regret the things you you did. You only regret the things you didn't do. But it's kind of true, and yeah, that's a huge fear of of mine. And you know, it's it's you're not you're just not guaranteed anything and yeah to bank so much on delayed happiness delayed gratification is very real yeah. you know you got to do it sometimes but yeah delayed happiness is like is a very scary thing because you're just wasting you're just wasting your time there there had been a lot of days especially before i did my own content creation where i'd wake up and you know, I'd wake up at like 5 a.m. and just look at a completely booked day and just go like, I can't wait till I go to bed again. Yes. And it yes. killed me to go like, literally the sun's not even up on this day and I'm already mm -hmm. wishing it was over. Mm -hmm. That 
feels wrong at like an elemental level <laughs> to, <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> like to wish your time away that way. And, uh, and I just want to, you know, when you feel those itches and those, those gut instincts of, you know, maybe you want to do something else with your time. I think it's important to try to listen to that. Don't be rash, yeah. but also don't, yeah. don't stuff it down and ignore it for 30 years. Because also like the options that we have now, like our parents and grandparents, they didn't have those. Yeah. And, and we don't even have the options they do of like, you work a job for 20 or 30 years with the same company and get a lifetime retirement. Like mm -hmm. that also isn't so much a thing anymore. <laughs> so, you know, I think we need to really take advantage of the world that we live in now yeah. and the fact that we can do these things and technology is so democratized and you can connect with the worldwide audience and, you know, you and I can be in an ocean between us and have a conversation exactly uh, is is kind of magical and if there's a way that you can make a living doing those things i mean that's it, it's like a gift to be in that position really. yeah definitely definitely i lied i actually have one final question oh, that's for fine. you <laughs> did you have fun uh, this was like some of the most fun i've ever had in a <laughs> podcast so thank you <laughs> ten thousand times for inviting me because it's totally like i was kind of tired after work and stuff today and this just like <laughs> I'm pumped for my arts commission meeting later today. <laughs> awesome. 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 It, it's, it's been a complete honor. It truly has an honor and a privilege having you on the show. Huge fan of your channel. If people, for the two of you in the back that have not subscribed <laughs> to this channel, link will be in the description below, but uh, go ahead. Is there anything you want to leave the audience with before we go? The, the biggest thing would be going back to what I said. My, my regret is not starting sooner. So mm -hmm. if you have that bug to make a thing, whatever it is, just make your own thing. The sooner you can jump in, even if it's imperfect, even if your skills aren't built up yet, the sooner you can jump in and get going. Like you cannot get better until you get started. And mm -hmm. I would just encourage you take that first step, dive in. That's the scariest part. And from then on, it's just building and just go for it. Awesome. Yeah, very true. Very true. And, and where can people find you? Uh, people can find me on YouTube, you know, <laughs> youtube.com slash Tom Buck. And then I'm at so darn Tom on Twitter and Instagram. And those are pretty much all the places. <laughs> you can also go to okay. hi, my name is Tom.com, which I think is a hilarious URL. And there's a uh, contact info and stuff there. <laughs> okay, cool. I will leave links to everything in the description below. So for the two people, maybe the one at this point, you know, everyone else went and hopped on it. So there's one person left for the one person back that hasn't already followed and subscribed. And go ahead and do so. Links for everything is down below. And also, did you want to plug your podcast as well? Oh, sure. Yes. Go um, for it. Uh, you can actually just go to hi, my name is Tom.com slash podcasts. And there's links to all three of them my personal one, The Enthusiasm Project, my podcast with Peter Lindgren, which is called A Podcast with Peter and Tom, and the podcast with my wife, Heather, which is called The Couples Table. They're all there. All right. All right. And links to that will also be down below. And it's available on all major podcasting platforms. It's only on MySpace. Okay. <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> it's like MySpace. You're trying to make me feel old. <laughs> no, it's it's on all the all the all the things. You can find it anywhere. Hey, would you have ever thought like MySpace? Like you look at the advent of social media. Like we were at, we were the the pre, we were the last generation before social yeah. media. So it's so insane. Like. I remember when social media when when MySpace was in its stride. I never thought it would go away, and then Facebook came around and Facebook toppled it. And right now, it's crazy to look at Facebook and be like, "This is, yeah, kind of a dead platform." Yeah, you know? it's just a lot of weird conspiracy theories and yeah, like, <laughs> sort of racist things from right? distant relatives. Uh, yeah, right? I, don't, I don't hang out there very much anymore, but I do kind of miss my MySpace page. So. Dude, that that taught us how to code, like literally, yes, like <laughs> web design coding. Like I look at my like like Facebook at this point. Like, dude, I it's so weird. And I know I and this is not even part. <laughs> I, I said last thing, and then we're we're over here talking about this. But I swear this would be the last part. But I I go on the, the only thing I use Facebook now for is family and friends yeah yeah friends. Hyped, you know because at this point like you know a lot of her family my, my wife uh Lehua, her family's on um they're on facebook and so like mm -hmm. we post stuff 
about oh updates about the baby or that you know people will flood in like oh what's going on didn't know you you were having a kid and you're like yeah but you said congratulations on the announcement a couple months ago all right but if it's anything personally that we're doing no one cares and it's like facebook just seems like the place where people it's a lot of vanity on that platform a a lot of vanity and ignorance yeah, it is. And I, I've been on it. The thing that's really kind of kept me there was groups. Um, mm-hmm. Groups can be kind of cool, actually. Yeah. I don't hate Facebook groups, but <laughs> I'm sort of just tired of the stuff you have to wade through to get there. So I've just been trying to spend less and less time. But yeah, there's certain you know relatives and stuff who I would essentially have no connection to mm-hmm. about it. And so that's kind of, you know, keep my little yeah. finger in that world just for that reason. Yeah. But... <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm wondering what the next thing is. Like, it's crazy how a lot of people are only now deciding to jump on Twitter, and it's like, yeah, t- t- learning Twitter, the algorithm. I think just social media in general, each platform's algorithm and how to post, how frequently to post. Mm-hmm. You know, ha- use hashtags, don't use hashtags, use pictures or videos. It is a full time job. So for anyone who wants to be a content creator. <laughs> The other aspect of being quasi successful or successful in this is learning how to do that, like how to use social media, because just uploading, I don't think that's enough, honestly. Yeah. And if you go to someone's Twitter feed and every post is just the YouTube generated, like I uploaded a video, I uploaded a video like that's not it took me a while to understand Twitter, maybe about the past year or so. But once I got it, I was like, oh, this is pretty fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, with that being said, you guys can catch this episode of the podcast, along with many others on video format here on YouTube.com slash Mikel Casanova or on Twitch.tv slash Mikel Casanova. But if you're looking for it in the most popular form, which is in audio format, you can catch us on every major podcasting platform being Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. Yes, I have to count because I forget. Um, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Pandora. And we just recently got on Amazon Music. So catch us over there. If you want to support what we do, we do have Patreon. So whatever you guys invest into us, we reinvest into the podcast and the other outlets we have. So patreon.com slash Mikhail Casanova. And all my plugs are out the way. I need... The one person in the back, maybe two, we may have someone else who didn't know, but for y'all to come and subscribe to Tom's channel, follow him on social media, go to his website as well, listen to and subscribe to his three podcasts. They're all phenomenal. And uh, yeah, have a great day and, and, and have a great time if you're a content creator. Have fun creating, because especially if you're doing YouTube, put the you back in YouTube. Have yes, fun. Absolutely. Have fun. And uh, with that being said, Tom and I are signing out. You guys have a majestic day. Aloha and mahalo. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode. I hope it was informative, engaging, and you enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure you go ahead and leave a rating and a review. It greatly helps out the podcast and helps the platforms that we're on. Go ahead and promote us more so that more people can check it out. And if you're wondering what all platforms we're on, aside from what you've listened to it on, we're available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Pandora, Spotify, Amazon Music, and more. And if you want to support the podcast, then we've got Patreon, so patreon.com slash Mikel Casanova, which allows us to continue doing what we're doing. If you're looking for this in video format, we're also available on twitch.tv slash Mikel Casanova, as well as youtube.com slash Mikel Casanova. So with all that being said, I'll catch you on the next episode of Hawaii's number one podcast and the number one podcast in the Pacific, the Casanova Podcast. You have a great day, and I'll see you on the next one.